the early universe. So we're going to go back from 400,000 years back to almost zero, very close to zero. And to do this, we're going to talk about uh, how, when the atoms formed, also when nuclei formed, and then something called inflation, which we can infer has happened from uh, what we observe uh, from the cosmic microwave background and also what we observe uh, the universe to be like today. So this is a basic picture of what, uh, it's also giving you a hint of what's going on. Uh, so over the course of time, the age of the universe that we can measure using the cosmic microwave background is just shy of 14 billion years. And uh, the first stars formed about 400 million years after the Big Bang. So, but in those first 400 million years, the, the only radiation traveling through the universe was this cosmic microwave background radiation, and we call that the Dark Ages. Uh, and then at 375,000 uh, years is when uh, the cosmic microwave background was formed. So, as we go back in time, uh, the universe is getting hotter and hotter and hotter. So, uh, we're today, we're about 10 to the 17 seconds after the Big Bang. And as we go back in time, when we're uh, a few millions of seconds after the Big Bang, that is when the uh, cosmic microwave background formed. And as we go further back in time, we have other particles forming. And we're going to go all the way back to around here uh, and talk about what went on at that time. So as the universe changes its size, different components of the universe start to do dominate. So how the density of the material changes with how the universe changes size. And we've talked a bit about this. So normal matter, or dark matter, it doesn't matter, uh, as the universe gets bigger, where R is something like the size of the universe or the distance between two things, the energy density goes down as the cube of one over the cube of that size. And that makes sense because I have a given amount of stuff and if I have to spread it out over a larger volume, the density goes down. Radiation, on the other hand, goes down, as we discussed, a little bit faster as the universe gets bigger. So now if I think about going back in time, uh, if matter dominates today, let's say, uh, as I go further back in time, right now vacuum energy dominates, which I'll talk about. Maybe I'll bring that up so we can talk about all three at once. So today dark energy dominates. If I go back in time a little bit, right now matter is about one-third of, of the energy density. So if I go back to when the universe was just a little bit smaller, uh, you can see the energy density of matter goes up very quickly as the universe, uh, if we go back in time. So only a few billion years ago, uh, matter dominated the energy density of the universe. Okay? Uh, but if we go back further in time, you can see that uh, the radiation gets more and more important as you go back further in time. And in fact, when the universe was maybe 10,000 years old and earlier, radiation dominated uh, the energy density of the universe. Now, but there's one other part to this, which I didn't talk to you about, is uh, there's another component that you can imagine to the energy density of the universe, and that is whether the space is curved, right? The space is curved. And if you think about curving something, you know, if you curve it more or less, it takes more or less energy, and it turns out the energy density that corresponds to space being curved uh, 
also decreases with how big the universe is, but it decreases uh, like this power of minus two. So there's this strange thing, like right now, we find that this curvature is very close to zero, right? Maybe to within uh, a percent or what, or a few percent of zero. But now if you go backwards in time, that component is less and less important. Less and less important. Like when the universe was uh, a tenth of its size, it would be less important by a factor of 10 relative to the matter, and so on as you go back. So it seems kind of a, it's one of these puzzles that we have. Why is the universe so close to flat? We call this the flatness problem. Why is the universe so close to flat? It's because in the past, uh, to make it om almost flat today to within a few percent, when the universe was at the cosmic microwave background, let's say, it would have to be within one part per million of being flat. And if we go back even further in time, it would have to be in one part per trillion of being flat. So there's something about the universe that when it got started, it was made to be almost perfectly flat, okay? And that's something we have to explain. That's called the flatness problem. Right? So in the past, the universe must have even been closer to flat than today. And why did it get set up in such a way? How could it be so precisely tuned to being flat? So this is one puzzle that we know about the universe today uh, that we have to figure out what, what set up the universe to have these initial conditions. So this is just zooming in on uh, the evolution of the universe now, we have uh, how big it is, where now is all the way to the, to the right. And as when the universe was smaller, it was hotter. And you can see it starts out here at about three degrees, and it goes all the way up over here at where at tens of billions of degrees. Uh, and this is showing different components of the universe. So one thing that's kind of cool that happens, and maybe we'll be able to measure it, is there, there, just like there's photons in the universe that make up the cosmic microwave background, there's also neutrinos. And they're just a little bit colder than the photons. Yes? Is the energy that causes the curvature Yeah, it's the gravitational part, right? It's accounting for that. Uh, Okay, if we look at other things, uh, we can look at the energy density of normal stuff. This is baryon, normal stuff like hydrogen and helium and protons. And here, this is the energy density of the photons. And you can see when the universe was about a 10,000th of its current size, before that time, radiation dominated the universe, okay? Now, if we, uh, and, and after this line over here, vacuum energy dominates the universe, right? So here, it's, this is a region of matter. And when matter dominates the universe, that means that structures can start to collapse on themselves because matter pulls other matter in very effectively. When radiation dominates the universe, it doesn't work so well because if you try to pull stuff together, radiation goes at the speed of light. So it'll just fly away from a clump. So structure essentially grows like things like galaxies grow from this time to this time. And then now we're past the epoch of forming the big galaxies, okay? So we're going to talk about different, uh, we're not going to talk too much about the first reaction, but we're going to talk a lot about how we made up uh, the elements in the Big Bang. And we're going to also talk in a bit of detail about when atoms formed uh, to make up the cosmic microwave background. The first step is, uh, well, how did matter come about in the universe? We'll talk, I'll 
we're going to kind of gloss over that, but there's a puzzle there if you think about it. Uh, it's why is the universe full of matter instead of antimatter? We can make uh, matter from energy, and that's what that shows there. If I take two gamma rays and slam them together, it can make, in this case, an electron and a positron. We could also slam them together and make uh, the components of a proton, except the problem is whenever I make a bit of matter, the electron, I also make a bit of antimatter. So there's no way in this process to make uh, extra matter. And we're all made out of matter. So in the universe, uh, there's essentially, it's all matter. There's no antimatter or very little antimatter. And that fact tells us that back in this time when you were starting to create uh, electrons and positrons or, or when this process actually stopped, when the gamma rays did, no longer had enough energy to make electrons and positrons, that you ended up with an extra, uh, extra electrons and extra protons. And how much extra you needed isn't very much. It's for every billion anti-electrons or positrons, you needed a billion and one electrons, right? Or for every billion anti-protons, you had a billion and one protons. But we don't have a theory that can explain even that tiny, tiny, tiny imbalance between matter and antimatter. Uh, in, in the theory of, of the standard model of particle physics, there are slight imbalances between matter and antimatter, but they're much, much too small to explain uh, the material in the universe. So that's a puzzle, that first step. The next two are pretty well understood because in the one case we're doing nuclear reactions that are sort of like what goes on in the sun and on the right we're just combining electrons and protons. But we're going to start with uh, looking at that cosmic microwave background again and we can see these little, the little pock marks on there. So what happened at that time is uh, the, on the right, on the left, the universe is still hot and you can see there's nuclei there, in particular protons and helium nuclei. And if you were to count, I think you'll, maybe there's one helium nucleus and then something like uh, 15 protons. And then there are a whole bunch of electrons around. And when the universe cooled to about 3,000 degrees, we call this recombination which means that the electrons combined with the nuclei and then you formed atoms and now the light can just propagate freely to till today. Uh, and that's basically what happened at that moment in time. If you look at the temperature, it's not terribly large. I can make that 3,000 degrees if I wanted to in my microwave here, those little lights up there, they're about 3,000 degrees. It's not an unusually high temperature. So we really understand this process very well. So this is how it looks like from our point of view. We're sitting in the middle. We're looking out to a redshift of around 1,100. So if we think about the temperature today, uh, that's 3,000 degrees, uh, well today it's 273, which is equal to 3,000 degrees divided by 1,100. So that's the temperature today is just down by that much. And this is, this is called the surface of last scattering, because like I said, what was happening to the photons up to that time is they were being scattered by the electrons. But this is almost completely uniform across the sky. It's all about the same temperature, which is kind of a weird puzzle. And this, this picture maybe shows you why. It tells you two different things, this picture. So the time between the beginning of time and the surface of last scattering was very short, just 400,000 years. 
400,000 years. And in that time, light, more or less, can just travel, what, 400,000 light years, about. And what's, what's pointed up there is those little is showing that the light from this little part here, this little part of the cosmic microwave background, could know about this little part of the universe. That's all, right? Because from outside there, the, the radiation can't come that far, that fast. So this little region, it turns out, on the sky is about a degree. Right? So those little pock marks that you see on the sky are essentially about how big the region of the universe that could talk to it, itself up till that time. That's how big. Uh, does that make sense? So like today, the universe is 13 billion years. So 13 billion light years is sort of the region that you can look around. Back then, it was 400,000 years. So if I were sitting there, I don't know about any part of the universe beyond something 400,000 light years away. Okay? And so what that means is, is that this part of the universe here, and even something over here, uh, can't, they don't know about each other. Right? They don't know about each other. So how come they ended up being almost exactly the same temperature? to within one part per 10 to the 5. Like, how did this part of the universe realize uh, that it had to be the same temperature as that part of the universe, all the way on the other side? They never were able to talk to each other in the standard idea of the Big Bang. This is called the horizon problem. So what that means is, is that there's no way uh, that the entire universe could coordinate to be at the same temperature. Now you could just say, oh, well that's just the way it is. Everything over the entire universe was set up to be at exactly the same temperature just by fiat. We don't like that. We want an explanation, not just that it happened that way. And it turns out there is an explanation. And that explanation solves this horizon problem it also will solve the flatness problem, and it will also explain why uh, the universe isn't entirely smooth. But we'll get to, I don't know if we'll get to that today, but we will get to that soon. So this is just showing it a bit zoomed in. So if we think about where the cosmic microwave background uh, forms, uh, if I think about a given part of it like that, it can only know at that time this is about how big the universe was from its point of view. That's the region that it could see. Because beyond that, the universe isn't old enough for the light to get that far. So the radius of those little balls is about 300,000 uh, light years, right? So the, here it's been zoomed in, so there aren't that many are going around the sphere. But that's the basic idea. So this little region over here, in this little region, the temperature can all be about the same because it has had time to reach equilibrium. But one over there is entirely separate. It's a different part of the universe that could have never communicated with each other. I know this is kind of giving you a bit of a headache, uh, but we'll, we'll, I'll show some pictures when we solve this problem that might help you realize how it works. Uh, what else? So similarly, uh, over this time, over this distance is also the distance about which sound waves could travel in the early universe. And that distance of how sound waves, how far they travel, is the size of those little pock marks on the cosmic microwave background. So those little, mar those little things that look like pimples on the baby face of the universe are actually uh, about the size of, um, it's a measurement of how big the universe was uh, from the point of view of something at the cosmic microwave background. I know that's hard to think about, but so that this, this cosmic microwave background has given us a couple pieces of information. One, 
that the universe is almost flat, two, that the universe was very close to uniform, but not precisely uniform. Like, if, if you argued, oh, well, something made it absolutely perfectly smooth, well, then you'd also have to say, well, it's not actually perfectly smooth, so why isn't it? And we have an explanation that deals with both of those, uh, well, all three of those problems. Why is it the universe almost perfectly flat? Why uh, is it almost perfectly uniform, but not exactly uniform? Okay. Now we're going to go back a bit further in time to only a few minutes after the Big Bang. And at that time, the universe was uh, about a billion degrees or so. Uh, and what we're going to try to explain is, in this picture, uh, we talked about essentially how all the elements form except for the ones in blue. And those are like the most common elements in the universe. We never explained how helium formed. And we're going to learn how helium formed, how lithium formed, and uh, those, those first uh, elements that were made in the universe. So we call this Big Bang nucleosynthesis, how we make elements during the Big Bang. And it's, it's not... Uh, well, this makes it maybe look kind of hard, but basically in the Big Bang at the beginning, you had neutrons and protons, which are down there in the lower left. And it turns out you have about, uh, for every uh, neutron, you have about seven protons. And those neutrons and protons, when the universe is about 10 seconds old, I think that's right, about 10 seconds old, the neutrons and protons now uh, can run into each other and they can stick and make deuterium. Now, when the universe was younger, it was hotter, so these deuterium would just get hit by uh, a gamma ray and break apart. But starting when the universe is about 10 seconds old, the neutrons and protons could stick together. And what happens is, is after about 10 minutes, that's the half-life of the neutron, the neutrons start going away and they're no longer there. So during between about 10 seconds and 10 minutes after the Big Bang, these reactions can go. So a neutron runs into a proton, the proton makes now it's a deuterium, sort of like what goes on in the sun. Remember the first step of the sun was proton plus proton goes to deuterium. But thereafter, things can go kind of similar to the sun. The deuterium can pick up another proton and make helium-3, but it can also uh, run into a deuterium and make a helium-3 and spit out a neutron, or the deuterium can pick up uh, run into another deuterium and stick out a proton. There are a bunch of different possibilities, but basically they end up over here making helium, which is sort of what the sun does, right? But it's doing it in a little bit of a different way because in the sun you don't have all these neutrons floating around. And you can also make other elements up there, some lithium and beryllium, and we'll talk about all of those guys. So from about 10 seconds after the Big Bang, you can start making deuterium. So during this time, from 10 seconds to about 20 minutes, there, the, it's hot enough that you can have nuclear reactions between these materials. Uh, and after about 20 minutes, almost all the neutrons that are free have decayed into protons. And at 10 seconds after the Big Bang, there are about six protons for every neutron. But over the course of those next 20 minutes, some of those neutrons decay. So on average, there are about seven protons for every neutron. So we can think about how these guys can pair up. And it's actually a kind of easy calculation. So the red guys are my uh, protons. So up on top, I have seven protons and one neutron. And on bottom, I have seven protons and one neutron. And basically, the, all the neutrons 
nearly all the neutrons get bound up in helium. So there's the helium nucleus, two protons, two neutrons, helium four. And then on, on uh, the left are the protons that didn't pair up in to make helium. So if we think about what, what this tells us is that for every helium atom in the universe, there are 12 hydrogen atoms. Or if we think about it in, by mass, the, the universe will be 75% hydrogen and 25% helium. It's just the math is pretty simple, right? And it turns out uh, one can look at how all of these different elements, different things change between about 10 seconds after the Big Bang out there to on the, on the right is uh, about three hours after the Big Bang. So if you look, we, at the beginning we have protons and neutrons. You can see the neutrons, basically all of them end up as in helium-4. And we can look at what these numbers are and we end up with helium-4 and protons. The neutrons during this time, between about 100 seconds and 1,000 seconds after the Big Bang, are getting caught up in other uh, in these nuclear reactions, and then afterwards they just kind of decay away. Uh, but we also make other things. We make deuterium. Here's deuterium. This is helium-3. This stuff is called tritium, which is another uh, isotope of hydrogen, but that decays after about 11 years. So at the end of the Big Bang, we have all of these different elements, but the basic thing is what's at the top which is what we'll focus on if we go to the next page, uh, you can see that the helium ends up about 25% of the universe in mass ends up as helium. So that box at the top shows what the measurements are of how much helium there is in the universe. And what's along the bottom axis is what's the mass density, how many protons or how many baryons, normal matter, is in the universe. And that number is how I say, right, if I remember I said that there's about a billion, uh, there was one extra proton for every billion antiprotons. This number on the bottom corresponds to that, that we have one proton for every billion photons in the universe, more or less. Uh, and it, if you can see, if the density of the universe is larger, uh, then you make more helium and you make more lithium, but you make less of those other things. The vertical axis, that vertical stripe, is telling us what we measure to be the amount of uh, normal matter in the universe from WMAP, uh, which is sitting right there. Like if we translate this into a fraction of the whole universe, that's about 4% of the critical density, which is, and this is where we measure it, both from the cosmic microwave background and from the elements that got made at the beginning of the universe. We can conclude, not by counting stars, not by measuring the gas in today's universe, but in the early universe, we can, that's our best measurement of the total mass of the normal stuff in the universe, not the dark matter. It's only a few percent. Okay, does that make sense so far? So if there were more normal matter, uh, we'd end up having less of these funny guys today. We'd have less deuterium and we would have less helium-3. So we measure that's how much deuterium there is. Here's lithium, which is another element that's kind of, uh, well, it's used in batteries, right? So it's lucrative, but it was made a lot of it in the early universe, so we can uh, measure how much lithium there is, and we find that the universe has uh, only a few percent of baryons. So I want to go back a bit further now, a bit further in time. Uh, and physics has been about sort of trying, a lot of physics is about trying to explain more and more phenomena with fewer and fewer basic ideas. And, uh, you know, in the 
19th century, people realized that electricity and magnetism were two parts of the same thing, and we call that electromagnetism. Uh, in the 20th century, people realized that the electromagnetism and what causes nuclear decay, radioactive decay, were the same thing. And the last bit of that was the discovery of the Higgs boson, which was a couple years ago. People got Nobel Prize for that. So, but we think if we go back to uh, uh, higher temperatures, higher energies, you can see at the top, we think also that the strong nuclear force should join with those other two forces. And if we go back even to higher and higher temperatures, there's some point where gravity, we think, joins in too. But way back there, we don't actually have any reasonable theory of what goes on here. But we're going to focus on this part. So whenever you have these sort of unifications, uh, you can have funny physics going on. So like over here, all three of these are unified, and then over here they're split up. And in that process of one becoming separate, you can develop a situation in the universe when it gets filled with this vacuum energy or dark energy. And we know what dark energy is doing to us today in our universe. We measure it. It makes the universe expand ever faster with time. It makes it accelerate. And what we're going to go through is what are the consequences of what uh, if a universe accelerates, if its expansion gets faster and faster. Now, when this was first proposed, people didn't realize that today's universe was accelerating. So they gave it another name. They called it inflation. Uh, and our universe right now although it's very go doing it kind of slowly over tens of billions of years, is entering an epoch of inflation. But this is the epoch of inflation that I'm going to talk about. It's when the universe was very, very young. And here's the basic idea of uh, how the evolution of the universe has gone since uh, the beginning up till today. So as you go backwards in time, the universe gets smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller. Uh, but we think, and I'll argue why we think that is in a moment, that there was a time in the early universe when it grew incredibly fast. So it grew uh, a factor of 10 to the 50 or so, or 10 to the 60, in an absolutely minuscule amount of time. And from then till now, it hasn't even grown that much. It hasn't grown as large a factor since then. And I'll explain why we think that's true in a second. Now, what is our universe going to do in the future past that arrow? If it keeps on going as it's going and accelerating, it'll shoot up just like it did here at the beginning. So this period is a period when the universe was dominated by dark energy, but a much more powerful dark energy than we have today. And then over here, it's doing the same thing. So it will go up like this. Whoop! But, you know, we're at this moment, so we don't know what it's going to do yet. But if it keeps doing what, we, what it's doing now, it'll go up like that instead of being more or less a straight line. So this era is called the era of inflation. So why do we like this? Okay, so the universe gets bigger by a huge factor. Now, if you remember, let's imagine before inflation, there could have been matter around, there could have been curvature around, there was radiation around. And if you think about the different components of the universe, what happens to them as, they, as the universe grows? Uh, the curvature and the radiation density and the density of matter all drop very quickly as the universe grows. If the universe grows by a factor of 10, the density of radiation goes down by 10,000, the density of matter by 1,000, the density of curvature uh, by 100. So if you think about it, the universe is, and the density of the dark energy stays the same. 
So whatever was going on in the universe here, right? The universe is expanded by 10 to the 60, which means that if the universe before them was somewhat curved, the energy density of that curvature goes down by 10 to the 60 squared, 10 to the 120. If there was any stuff in the universe, like matter or radiation, afterwards it's gone down by 10 to the 240, or 10 to the 200 and, not 200, 180. So before this epoch, the universe could have been whatever you wanted it to be. It could have been filled with elephants. But afterwards, the, the universe has grown so much that those elephants are so spread out that there won't be any elephant in our part of the universe, right? It could have been really curved, but it's expanded so much that it's going to be flat afterwards. So this inflationary model, and I'll show you maybe some pictures, but if it turns, why aren't you going to turn? No, I don't want to do that. That's going too fast. So here we imagine if the universe is curved, we're on the surface of the balloon, we're an ant, and if I blow up the balloon, uh, it looks much less curved. And in fact, if I blow up the balloon by 10 to the 60, it's not going to look curved at all. But if we also think about it in that terms of the energy density of stuff, uh, you can see how it works mathematically, right? So. Uh, this inflation sets up the universe to be flat to within one part of 10 to the 120. So that's pretty darn flat. And the universe has expanded since, but not by that much. So it's still flat to as, as best we can measure. Okay? So this is the flattening of the universe. The other thing is it makes the universe essentially empty afterwards. And there's lots of evidence for inflation that I'll go through. Uh, but the first one was the question of how come our universe is so close to the critical density once you add everything together. You add the dark energy, the matter, the radiation. It adds up almost to this critical density. And it's a very strange coincidence uh, that it does, because you could imagine uh, where we've waited 14 billion years and we still don't know whether the universe, you know, is above or below critical. And the thing is, is that it, imagine if you were to throw a ball or launch a rocket up into the air and you got it at precisely the escape velocity of the Earth. That would be very, very hard to get it so precise. And for our universe to still look flat after uh, about 5 billion years or 6 billion years, you would have had to get it so precise to a part in 10 to the 20 or 10 to the 30 back at the early universe. And it's very hard to imagine how you would go about doing that. Except there's one way that the the universe can automatically become flat if you think about not there just being normal matter around that has normal gravity, but if you have something like dark energy, today dark energy is dominating the expansion of the universe, and it will make the universe get flatter and flatter and flatter as we go through forwards in time, right? If you had that same thing going on in the early universe, uh, you get the universe to become flat. So the idea is the universe expanded very close to the beginning of time when it was about 10 to the minus 30 seconds old. It expanded by a factor of 10 to the 60. And it needs to expand so much for it to be so close to flat today. But there's a, when you try to solve a problem, what, one thing that's very appealing is, is if you come up with a solution to one problem, which is to flatten the universe, it actually solves other problems at the same time. And I'll explain how it, it actually uh, accounts for two other things, uh, and one I won't talk about. But inflation solves essentially four problems at once. 
So I talked about how if we look at the cosmic microwave background, it's almost the same temperature in every direction. And the question is, how does that part of the universe, 14 billion light years away, know to be exactly the same temperature as that part of the universe, 14 billion light years in the other direction? Why is that a puzzle? Because they're separated by 28 billion light years. There is no way that that region of space could communicate with that region of space and, and set the temperature to be exactly the same if the expansion went in the normal way. So I'm going to show you a picture here. Let's say I set up the universe somehow to be all the same temperature within the region that is uh, that, that black circle is the region that is in causal contact with me at that time, meaning the region I can see, right? So I could imagine somehow I arrange everything in my neighborhood to be at the same temperature, and that's the blue temperature. The black circle is uh, how much of the universe you can see at any moment, and the red region is the region I, I couldn't touch at that early time, so it's at a different temperature. It's at the red temperature, not the blue temperature. Let's, we're going to evolve this forward in time. The universe is expanding, right? Oh, that's going backwards in time. The universe is expanding. So the region that I painted blue expands, and you can see it expands up there. And that's given that expansion, I've written it as R of T. So it started there, and the universe is not expanding uh, at an increasing rate. It's decelerating because there's normal matter in the universe. So the, the blue region gets bigger, clearly, right? Because the universe is expanding. But the universe expands slower than the speed of light, which is the outer curve I've written there as CT. It's just a straight line. So after a short time, even though I've arranged the whole universe to be the same temperature, when I look out now, I'll see further along, I can see further away, and it's going to be at a different temperature than what I've set up. And this is the horizon problem, that this is sort of our picture. If we were to look all the way on this side, we're looking on this part of the CMB, and it has somehow managed to be the same temperature as over there, but there was no way they could have been in causal contact. Do people under get that picture? The universe, uh, since it's expanding uh, slower than the speed of light, as time goes on, we see more and more of the universe. Okay? But let's think about the other option where we have something, an accelerating expansion like we have going on today. We start in the same way. I can set the temperature within my horizon to all be the same, and then the temperature of the rest of the universe is something different. I, I made it all red, but it could be like uh, one color over here, whoops, where's my arrow, and another color over there. could have been random, and maybe I'll make the, the graphic better later. So now the universe is accelerating. So that curve R of T, instead of curving inwards, is curving outwards. It's expanding ever faster with time. Okay? I've drawn the horizon. It's the exact same size of the circle as on the one on the, on the left. But look what's happened. The region of the universe that's been set to the same temperature is now expanded beyond the horizon. Do you see that? So what that means is if we have accelerating expansion, uh, we can arrange for a small region to be uh, set all at the same temperature, and as the universe expands, that region expands faster, fa expands faster than the region of the universe we can see. So the universe, as you go along, this is just a short amount of expansion, but if you were to expand it that 10 to the 60 times, the region of the universe that was initially very small and all the same temperature has now expanded to be larger, much, much larger than the region of the universe that we can see today. It is expanding faster than the speed of light. I've drawn it that way 
uh, 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 on purpose. Look at the angle. Uh, this is a space-time diagram that we've done before, right? So we have time in the vertical and space in the other. And CT is light. The edge of the universe is expanding. The distance between me in the middle and the edge is increasing faster than the speed of light. Because this slope here is uh, shallower than the other one. Now, does that mean anything? The thing with relativity, it means, it says, if I'm standing here, something can't go by me right here faster than the speed of light. This is something different. It's the distance between me and that distant object is increasing faster than the speed of light. That's actually okay in general relativity. Do you, do you have a question or I've dealt with it? Because light can only go at the speed of light. So the light's traveling along and we can see further and further away but the, the distance we can see is only really how long light can get from there to us. And it's actually a little bit bad because if you think of the light, it's coming from over there to us and the universe in between us and where it was emitted is expanding in the opposite direction. So the light actually has to work to get to us. It sort of maybe has to work against that expansion. Now you might say, let's, so what this means is, is the entire universe that we see today corresponded to a really, really tiny region back there at the beginning of time. How tiny? Very tiny. Uh, you know, like the distance across there of that little blue region is the speed of light times something like 10 to the minus 30 seconds. So it's really, really tiny. If you want to think about this inflationary epoch, when the universe was expanding exponentially, you could ask how big was the little horizon region at the end of inflation if you expanded it from that moment to today? Meaning how much of the universe, this might, well, it's hard. So it's like how much of the universe, uh, if we imagine how big this little region was, how much, to what size is it today? Uh, that region is the speed of light times like 10 to the minus 30 seconds. So that's 10 to the minus 20 uh, centimeters or so. By today, that's expanded just to something about this big. I don't know if that's going to hurt your head or whether you really know exactly what I mean, but everything else that's bigger than that at some time flowed out of this horizon and came back in. Uh, Okay, this is the accelerating expansion. Now, if you think about what's going on today in our universe, we're in this same epoch of accelerating expansion. And what that means is, is what we're seeing today, if you were watching this, objects flow out of our horizon. So in the future, In the future, we're going to see much less of the universe than we do today, right? So that's kind of sad. But in the distant future, every other object beyond our Milky Way, Andromeda, and a few nearby galaxies will flow out beyond that black line, and we won't see it anymore. That black line is the part of the universe that we can see at any moment within there. Okay, so... The, that now this time in the universe where we can see everything going on and we see billions of galaxies, in 10 billion years we won't really see that many galaxies at all. So we're in a special time. So I said it could, it could solve a bunch of problems. So that first one says that the regions in the universe, they expand so much that you expect the universe today to be almost precisely the same temperature, or actually exactly the same temperature, if you think of it classically. It's like the universe was a big bathtub, whoops, and there was more than enough time, whoops, for this region to all reach the same temperature, and then the bathtub, there was hot water at one end, cold at the other, it mixed up, 
in this early, early time of the universe, so it's nearly almost exactly the same temperature, and then this bathtub has expanded to be bigger than the observable universe. That's what's the accelerating expansion, so everything is at the same temperature. However, that's not what we observe. We see things to be a slightly different temperature in different directions, and we can figure out how that happens. And during the, uh, the black hole uh, tutorial, you learned maybe a little bit about something called Hawking radiation. This is the same idea, but it goes on in the early universe. So I, I'm just going to show you uh, how things might work. Uh, I've written it with an electron and a positron. It can be any particle, an antiparticle. So imagine we're just in a, a regular part of the universe where the universe is decelerating. The expansion is decreasing with time. Uh, if I, in the vacuum where there's nothing around, you're always creating particles and antiparticles and they fly apart and then they come back together. And you might say, oh, well, I don't see that happening. But that is what happens and we can do measurements that show that that is indeed happening, even in empty space, okay? So let's imagine that goes on in our decelerating universe. Uh, if you remember, with time, you get to see more and more of the universe. So what that means is, is that when I have this particle and antiparticle created, they can always find each other again. They will never get so far apart that they can't find each other again and annihilate. And in the end, you end up with nothing. You start with nothing, you form this pair, and you end up with nothing. But if the universe is accelerating, it's the same picture as before, what can happen is this little region of the universe here in blue has run out of contact with the rest, with over here. So what can happen is, is one element of the pair goes one way and gets caught up in the expansion of the universe and ends up disconnected from its partner. So from the point of view of someone in this part of the universe over here, I'm standing here, I just see a positron fly by. I'll also see electrons fly by, but they aren't the same uh, member of the pair, the, uh, one, one member of the pair flew out of the universe, out of my observable universe, the other stayed in. So if you have this region where the, the expansion is accelerating, even if it's entirely empty of particles that are, were there from the start, you will, uh, particles are created by this accelerating expansion. The particles get created because you have these pairs forming and they get separated. You can imagine like one is going uh, through the horizon of the universe. It's very similar to one member of the pair going into a black hole and the other pair uh, not. And that's what accounts for the, what's called Hawking radiation. You have this Hawking radiation in the early universe and what that does means that it's not perfectly smooth anymore. Some parts of the universe get a little bit more of these particle creation and other particle parts of the universe get a little bit less. So the universe isn't precisely all the same density, but it's varying by a little bit. And you can calculate how much it varies and how much how strong is that amount of variation on different scales, like on a bigger scale or a smaller scale today? And it turns out that that agrees with the amount of inhomogeneity that we observe in the cosmic microwave background, and it agrees with the amount of inhomogeneity that we need to create the structure of the universe today. So this is showing sort of what happens is the universe isn't completely homogeneous due to this inflation, due literally to quantum mechanical fluctuations during inflation. Those regions that are a little bit denser than average will collapse in on themselves 
starting when the universe is about 10,000 years old. So we have the dark matter can start clumping. The normal matter is trapped with the photons, if you remember. Normal matter interacts with light, and light likes to keep things smooth. So nothing happens to the normal matter just yet. The dark matter starts to clump, and uh, eventually, after you know hundreds of millions of years, the normal matter falls into these dark matter clumps that are already formed, and that normal matter forms the first clusters of galaxies and galaxies. So these fluctuations, what we call a galaxy today, resulted from back during inflation, just a quantum mechanical fluctuation, a bunch of uh, uh, antiparticles or particles that got created during this inflationary epoch. And you could say it's a nice story, but the story makes very concrete predictions of how much structure there should be on every scale, and those predictions uh, agree with what's observed. So in this idea of thinking about why is the universe so close to flat, you end up explaining why it's so close to flat, why it is so close to homogeneous, and why it, where the inhomogeneities come from. Now, in this early time, you can also make, and people are trying to observe this, these quantum mechanical fluctuations can include gravitational radiation. Uh, and we're trying to observe that as well. That hasn't yet been observed. And uh, uh, the observation of the gravitational radiation from this epoch would tell us exactly when the epoch started, you know, how close to what we call the Planck time, which I'll talk about in a minute, did this epoch of inflation uh, start. So these little seeds in the cosmic microwave background are hallmarks of that inflationary epoch. Another funny thing that you can see uh, already in the cosmic microwave background, but I didn't really uh, tell you explicitly, is if you look, this region over here is a little bit redder than this region, right? So this region over here has more structure than over here. And if you remember, at the time of the cosmic microwave background, the region of the universe that could talk to itself was this big. So this whole region got caught up in a very large scale quantum fluctuation during inflation. That's why that whole region is a little bit uh, um, hotter than the rest. So the fact that we see this tells us that, that this also was going on. Because if you set up any fluctuations, let's say just by fiat, at the beginning of time, there'd be no way to make them any bigger than these little pockmarks. Because this region and that region, again, were connected uh, weren't connected before between inflation and today. Okay? I know this is hard. I think it's hard to understand, but this is how the universe works. So th these initial fluctuations with time just grow up from gravity into the structure that we have today. And everything holds together almost perfectly. There are little things that little details that uh, we don't completely understand. And often those little details are the lead to a breakthrough. Like we remember talking about little details about the orbit of Mercury led to evidence for general relativity, which was a completely different way of looking at gravity. Here, there's still little details of how the structure is growing that we don't understand. But for the most part, we understand nearly everything. So just to go backwards through time, starting with what we talked about here in the early universe, we talked about this epoch of recombination, which was when the at first atoms formed, and we see the cosmic microwave background from that moment, and that's 400,000 years after the Big Bang, or 379,000 years if you want to be precise.
And then we go backwards in time, and then the next epoch, uh, well, there are a couple of epochs that we kind of get information about. This moment when matter started to dominate over radiation, that tells us how big the structures should be in the cosmic microwave background, how large they are. And then we talk back here, between about 3 and 20 minutes after the Big Bang, is when the universe made the helium that we find in the universe today. Nearly all of the helium was produced uh, between 3 and 20 minutes after the Big Bang. Then we, we go further back in time. Uh, eventually the universe gets so hot that even neutrinos can't travel very far in the universe. Uh, there's a time one millionth of a second after the Big Bang. Before that time, we didn't even have protons. That the universe was so hot and dense that the components of the protons, the quarks, were free before that time. But then we can go all the way back here. We have this inflationary epoch. We don't have that many hints between uh, one millionth of a second after the Big Bang and sometime around 10 to the minus 33 seconds after the Big Bang is when we believe inflation to occur. It could occur a bit later or a bit earlier than this. Uh, but it really has to uh, occur around that time. And we think it has to do with an epoch when, the all, when three of the four forces of nature were unified. The strong, the weak, the electromagnetism force were unified uh, before this time. So we call that the grand unification epoch. We don't know really anything about it, right? So this inflation is a paradigm that explains a whole lot of things, but we don't know what particular physical process led to it, but we believe that it happened. And then if we go all the way back here at 10 to the 43 seconds, we talk about something called the Planck time. And what that means is, is before that time, the universe was so hot that if you made a photon, you know, it's when you heat up the universe or heat up anything, you get photons created. And at that time, the typical energy of a photon was so large that once you made a photon, it would also be a black hole. And before that time, we have to think about the theory of uh, general relativity and quantum mechanics, we have to smush them together into something called quantum gravity, which we don't know what that is. So we can't even really talk about what's going on uh, before that time, and we call that the Planck epoch. And the epoch of inflation, if you think about where it sits, if it sits closer to the Planck epoch, down this way, then the production of this gravitational radiation during the inflationary epoch becomes more and more effective. So that's why people are so desperate to measure the gravitational radiation from inflation, because that would tell you uh, when it happened, at what energy it happened. So this, we've gone right back to the beginning, uh, or as close to the beginning as we can. Really, everything before this red region, we know the red region has happened, but we don't understand it completely well. Uh, and before the red region, it's, we're guessing. And, and to a certain extent, it doesn't matter what happened before inflation. Because like I said, the universe expands so much during inflation that it's effectively empty except for these quantum mechanical fluctuations. So before inflation, the universe could be filled with anything, but inflation effectively wipes the slate clean, wipes the slate clean, uh, and leaves us a, a universe that has certain properties, and those are the ones that we observe.